Welcome back to The Watch and House of the Dragon episode 7. Let us dive into it. So, overall, I liked it about as much as the last episode, which is I really liked it. I think uh, the show has proven itself to be consistent in a lot of its quality. It's dealing with setups and payoffs really well, characterization and dialogue top tier. Things are, for the most part, making sense. And look, there's one or two things that are, you know, I do have question marks, but they. They don't ruin uh, the whole thing, but this one, like I said, there are like, what about this? But overall, really good with some really great moments in this episode. One moment I actually loved, uh, which makes me like the character quite a lot. And uh, yeah, and you could kind of summarize this episode as like the dragon episode, dealing with a lot of uh, uh, the mechanics of how the dragons work, because uh, you, you might uh, figure out from there, uh, end of the last episode, you know, a dragon got a new rider that wasn't uh, considered a legitimate dragon lord, and uh, that leads into the events of this episode, and they are well paid off with some significant stuff happening, okay? Uh, I actually don't think this episode is uh, as slow as the last one, uh, because some serious significant stuff happens here, and there are some kind of action, almost slash horror moments in it, uh, with a big setup for the final episode, which will be next week. So, uh, really enjoyed it overall. A couple of question marks that I'll get into the specifics, and uh, let's dive into all the spoils and all, everything now. So, episodes open up with Rhaenyra confronting... Uh, I forget his name, is that Alan or is that the brother? But but the the guy that uh, basically um, sees smoke f chose as a rider, which is one of the illegitimate sons of Corlys Valerian. And uh, she's pretty happy about it, but he swears f fealty to her. And that basically makes her realize that maybe I've been going, approaching, you know, finding riders the wrong way because she was trying to look through the noble lines when this guy's clearly a bastard child of, of something, though he doesn't reveal that is the son of Corlys. Because the interesting thing, and they acknowledge this in the show, I'm glad about this, because I got a little bit confused. Uh, Corlys doesn't act, even though he is blood of old Valyria, uh, his line aren't dragon riders. It's because he was married to uh, a Targaryen, their children then could be dragon riders and uh, his wife was a dragon rider as well so he actually says you know i don't know about your mother but she must have had you know targaryen blood in her uh, somewhere along the line which allowed you know or qualified the bastard children to uh, be possible dragon riders so okay that's making sense and see how the show is um remaining true to the law, the mechanics of how this universe is supposed to operate, and even points out certain things just to answer the questions like, hey, you know, if you're wondering, does this work or does this work? It answers it and explains it that, no, 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 um, these bastard children are getting, yeah, that, that allowance for the dragons through their mother's line, and not him. Because uh, he says, you know, uh, we Valerians, we're not dragon riders. All right, so anyway, that was that's in a later scene. Um, Next scene is Laris kind of getting intel that Sea Smoke now has a rider. And I, look, it's an interesting scene because one, I forget the other noble guy, um, he is seeking favor from Laris over taking this to the king, but also he says, You're the master of whispers, maybe you'll know if this whisper is worth sharing. And Laris dismisses it because it comes through like. Four, it's like how many hands? It's not second hand knowledge. It's like third and fourth hand knowledge, right? And he and he says maybe this whisper is best left to the wind, even though it's, we know in context it's correct. Uh, but it is interesting that uh, he would dismiss it. Uh, it and that kind of answers why that perhaps this rumor might be getting spread around the city. But I have a question about other rumors later on. Now, Rhaenyra returns, and she goes to confide with the White Worm instead of a council, which is interesting. She, she's basically treating her as a confidant. Still don't like the White Worm and the setup of how she got into this position where she's at. But it's the White Worm that basically tells her that, you know, hey, this is the guy that, you know, Sea Smoke chose is a bastard. If you want to go after the bastards, I, I know where they all are. And that makes sense. Like, with her position of where she was in the city, working in the brothels and stuff like that, she would know of... 
uh, all the illegitimate children that the Targaryens, or a lot of them at least, because a lot of them end up in the whorehouses and the Targaryens visit the whorehouses and, and uh, they even set this up because in season one, when they're looking for Aegon um, just before the coronation, they mention and point out, like, there's a bastard child right there who is, you know, in one of those children fighting dens and stuff, and he has very, very blonde, light-coloured hair, indicating that he's a bastard child of Aegon, and so they said that, that, yeah, there's bastard children around, even from the direct royal line. And so it makes sense that the White Worm would mention that, and she has a context, contacts to try and get some of them to bring him over. And uh, Rhaenyra, uh, that's her plan now. It's like, all right, she's going to look to all the um, illegitimate children instead of anyone through any noble line that might have a Targaryen uh, ancestry to get stronger blood to uh, find riders for the dragon. Okay, it makes sense, right? Interestingly, that ticks off Jace. And at first, you're wondering why Jace is reacting so negatively. He even calls them mongrels. Why are you giving the dragons to mongrels? And it's explained from his perspective quite well. And this is just a sign of good writing, okay? Where he feels uh, really inadequate because he knows he is an illegitimate child, that he is a bastard. And one of the co consolations, uh, one of the things that makes him, I guess, uh, deal with it a bit better, he sees the fact that he is a dragon rider and that he has a dragon bonded to him as a type of legitimacy of his birth. But now that being given to all these bastards seems to, uh, to him, uh, make it feel that it's uh, taking away that sense of legitimacy that he's just, you know, a worthless bastard again. And so you can see why he reacts so negatively in that sense. Uh, you know, I still like him as a character, uh, you know, and he's very well, well written. And so I don't like that he calls, you know, people mongrels and stuff, but you can see uh, where that's kind of coming from, where it, it made him look like a jerk, but then you understand that's the way he sees it. And he draws the wrong conclusions, of course, but it's well justified. And the consistency of character writing is one of the strengths of the series and continues through. Good stuff to see. Damon is interviewing or, or having a meeting with the new Lord Tully. Is it Oscar? Uh, it's the young guy and just a well-written scene. He was like, you didn't care about me now. It's like, oh, you didn't have anything value there. Now you do. And th this guy, uh, the young Tully guy, right? He seems like he is going to be a little bit of a submissive or uh, uncertain about what to do in this first scene. But then he pulls out some really strong uh, decision making later on, which also pulls up Dale. And it's a very well written, strong character who also seems to have some moral fiber as well and is willing to, you know, um, say some slights against Damon. Basically true as well, by the way. Into in his face, and so his character is really good. I, like I'm interested in this character now, uh, and is showing some good strength uh, because Damon now now he can unite the River Lords, and also it helps me understand exactly the objection of what was happening. Where I was like in the previous episode, you saw some of the noblemen come and uh, uh, basically. Uh, tell Damon he is a total loser and that they'll never serve him or anything like that because he's done some really dodgy stuff. I was getting confused. Are they with the Blackwoods or Brackens? But no, these are actually not Blackwoods or Brackens. They are the other Lords of the Riverlands completely uh, disgusted with the actions that the Blackwoods did with Damon's order that they, they kind of know. And that's now coming... Those things that Damon did, they're coming home to roost and they're having issues because... Uh, that's the larger group of the River Lords that he needs to uh, basically be on his side. And he is banking on the fact that they will keep their oaths to the new Lord Tully. And Lord Tully is swearing allegiance to Damon, not because he likes Damon, but because the River Lords keep their oaths. And so this is all just good, engaging conflict. And it also has a, a, a just. As a medieval enthusiast, I love kind of seeing uh, politics uh, presented in that medieval perspective about uh, fealty, oaths, and uh, who will uh, side with who based on the coming conflicts. Really enjoyable stuff. That, like That's one of my things I've been enjoying about this series the most is uh, it's a very medieval, uh, authentic series, even though it's fantasy. Loving it, right? And... Uh, 
then there is the conflict of uh, so so now Lord Tully is so uh, with the River Lords, and he accuses the Blackwoods, I believe, of uh, doing horrendous things, which they true. But then he says, "But it was Damon that ordered me ordered me to." And the Lord, the young Lord Tully says, "No, no, you did it because you wanted to." And it was a good, strong line. He's like, "You did it because you did it because you wanted to." They've hated the you know Brackwins for ages back, and what's really interesting, and so this is a good moment, a good conflict where he says, for his actions, he deserves to be executed, and then he basically puts it into Damon's court and says, uh, will you dispense justice? I'm paraphrasing that part. And Damon, he knows he's the one who ordered this guy to do these terrible things, and he, it's now uh, on him to uh, execute the guy for his own orders. I wouldn't. I didn't expect Damon to do anything less because Damon, he is going to do. Is, is showing that he's willing to do very morally dubious things uh, to achieve his own ends multiple times. You know he feels guilty for it, but he's going to do it anyway. And, and the reason why, because you know, Damon, it's shown in uh, the whole arc with him being at. Um, uh, I forget the place where he's at. It'll come back to me later. I forget some of the names. There's a lot of names in the Song of Ice and Fire universe. And uh, in the flashbacks and uh, dream sequences he's had, he's showing guilt for a lot of his actions. And you know he feels like he has, he's reluctant, but he needs to do it anyway because that's what's going to unite the River Lords behind him. But it also is interesting because what will that mean the Blackwoods will do? Because they're not going to be happy that their uh, lord was just executed by the guy who ordered him to do those actions, right? So it's a good setup for the conflict. Um, and I wonder what will happen in the future. And isn't that good that you can have like expectations with confidence that they're going to be fulfilled in a satisfying way? <laughs> Contrast, yes, uh, we've just finished The Acolyte, where all our expectations were fulfilled in some of the most disappointing ways, and more, st and they were far stupider than I was expecting, right? With this, uh, a lot of the payoffs are happening in really interesting and satisfying ways. And so I wonder what will happen with this run, right? And so now the River Lords are going to swear to Damon, and uh, Damon, he, he leaves, right? Um, uh, he has guilt, but is, uh, he is... Uh, settled himself with it. He's like, I find that's what I needed to do. And he goes back to that room uh, and he runs into uh, another hallucination of his brother. Viserys is there. And so a good little scene where Viserys is like, you know, I never wanted the crown. It crushes whoever, uh, you know, bears it. And then he's like, you always wanted it, Damon. And it basically, Damon is having a hallucination where he is starting to perhaps come to terms with uh, the fact that being king is going to suck, even though I've wanted it my whole life. So it's just good implications about that. Um, next scene, Laris is pushing Aegon to recover sooner. And like it, Laris's relationship with Aegon is very interesting, where he, it does seem like he actually cares about him and is doing the whole kind of tough love, where he needs to go through a lot of pain to recover, push him further, and uh, Aegon is still in agonizing pain. But it really seems like Laris is throwing his allegiance to Aegon here. So, next scene, I, Corlys was shown to be at Dragonstone. And the next scene, he's on Driftmark talking to one of his bastard children. So, I've already had a question about how quickly uh, he gets from like point A to point B in terms of between Driftmark and Dragonstone. And my only conclusion, it must be, it must be pretty darn close. Oh, look, I'm going to pause. There might be a bit of a jump cut, but I... Well, not like there aren't jump cuts already, but I'm I'm going to look this up on the map. Oh wow, okay. Um, well that would explain it. So, <laughs> looking at the map, Driftmark is like the closest settlement to Dragonstone. So, all right, all right. I think that can answer my concerns there with how quickly uh, Corlys is able to go from Dragonstone to Driftmark. Dragonstone is on one island. Driftmark is on the nearest most island to it, just across uh, a small gap. Uh, and it's much closer to anything. Uh, like, uh, it is like 20 times closer than King's Landing. Uh, and yeah, High Tide is just near Driftmark. Problem 
solved and said it's just a small little boat ride that would probably take a couple of hours i'm thinking if maybe half a day uh to get from dragonstone and driftmark for all the times i i was getting concerned then because you know the, they've shown in, in in game of thrones the latter seasons that they ignore the distances on maps where this is actually explained quite nicely uh, but anyway, Corlys is back on Driftmark, and he talks with the other brother, illegitimate son of his, and that's the scene where he's like, you know, um, the Valerians don't have, uh, you know, they've never been dragon riders, and it's kind of subtly probing if this uh, son, illegitimate son wants to be a dragon rider, but he's like, no, I'm salt, salt and sea, just give me the sea, right? Uh, he's not interested, but his brother's always had greater ambitions. Uh, and it really does look like this this guy is going to be the heir of Driftmark if there's anything left of them alive at the end of the story. So, of the Valerians, right? Um, the next scene is when Jace has that kind of um, confrontation with his mother and he calls the lowborn um, uh, mongrels, basically. But it's really a fact that he sees himself as a mongrel and because they, and again, the only legitimacy he felt was the fact that there's a dragon rider, they get a dragon rider, so he sees that he's basically a mongrel now. And is questioning the legitimacy of his birth and that, that all makes sense with the, the conflict of his background, okay? That he is a bastard child and he knows it. And, and he says it, like, flatly, you know? The proof, he, he says, like, you, every, the proof is just looking at me, or something along those lines. The colour of his hair, right? Now, the next scene is kind of like the payoff where uh, the White Worm is sending a message to Lady in Waiting, or whatever the servant is, to collect all the um, illegitimate children of uh, the Targaryens, right? And here I have a bit of a... Um, writing plot hole issue because it isn't really done covertly in fact rumor about what's going on seems to spread all throughout the city so much so that it's a couple of just randoms in a bar mentions it to uh so in a previous episode there was a guy who was claiming to be of targaryen descent and it looks like he was actually lying about it but then is he really like it because we, uh, that gets paid off in this episode but they're the ones who mentioned it to him and he starts to like try and back out. Nah, well, I uh, might not. Uh, I'm starting to doubt it. And they're, they're like, oh, you've been saying it for ages, essentially. I'm paraphrasing. That's not the exact wording. But they're saying, you could be a dragon rider, right? And then the entire bar basically is cheering that, which is just kind of indicating the entire bar knows about it. And uh, the, the pub, right? Where they're at. The tavern. And this is where the issue comes in. If rumor spreads so much, I'm sorry, you cannot tell me that one of Laris's ears didn't hear about what's going on if it spread that much throughout the city like i've like and it seems like it takes a bit of time at least a day or so for rumor to spread that much like like one of laris's people would hear about it really quickly laris would hear about it, tell the king and then the king would basically uh sorry prince regent right um aemon and soldiers all throughout the city to basically either arrest or execute all those bastards to stop them from potentially being for future dragon riders it's kind of just not addressed, which is a pity because I do think the quality of writing is better than this. They usually have something to explain it. And if part of the rumor was that, I mean, I, 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 one, they could have just made it not spread so prevalently. I, they really show that this rumor is that nearly everyone knows about it. They should have just had that, um, if like it tell, they, the message get sent to the bastard children and then they say don't tell anyone if, if rumor gets out of this the king will kill you he doesn't want you to join any other society this is your chance to be a dragon rider okay but still don't tell anyone because your life is on the line if this really gets out uh and then like maybe uh, the, the spouse of uh, one of the illegitimate heirs who hears about it, which is friends with the guy at the bar, and then he goes more covertly, and it's not this kind of more public scene of everyone cheering him on. Because it just doesn't make sense the way that's done here. And I, 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 it is a plot hole. It's like, with the eyes and ears of the city, like, seriously, there's so many eyes and ears of the city that even when people are trying to hide their identity and not have things spread out in rumour, like when, um, uh, uh, the, the queen, my name just, um, escaped me. 
and it's on the tip. Rhaenyra, Rhaenyra, all right? When she sneaks out of the keep with the daemon in season one, there was still enough eyes and ease for what they did to be seen and reported. And now there's like, what, 30, you know, illegitimate children or more? Um, a rumor enough reaching them, and no, no single kind of informant sees any of it, and when it's that publicly known as well. Just look, it's a it's an annoying plot hole that uh, could have been handled a bit better. Okay. Um, uh, all right, all right. So turns out one of the um, illegitimate children is the blacksmith guy that we saw from the beginning, and. When I saw, as soon as he comes in in this context in this episode, everything kind of fits in. That's why we've got the setup of introducing him. And what I really liked is that he has blonde hair on the brighter end, but not so bright that it was blatantly obvious that you wondered when you first saw him. It uh, didn't even really cross my mind. But when it came up, you realize, yeah, his hair is a bit on the brighter side. Not to the full level. And it turns out he even says that um, he, I he explains his lineage that his mother seems to have been the illegitimate child of the same father as uh, Damon and Viserys or or their father was but i think he from what i said he's the cousin of of Damon and Viserys um in what he says that that, that was because he mentions you know so the children of my mother's brother, or something like that. Okay, so, so uh, that that's how, how it was set up. And a daughter, you find out that his daughter died, which sucks, right? And uh, this is a, a way for him to gain influence and power and give his wife a better life. His wife doesn't want it, but he is determined. And I'm liking this. In fact, he was already on the better side because, like, he was desperate to try and protect his family um, and his daughter's life. And he does something in this episode which really makes me like this guy. Uh, so, and then it, it, the, the payoff that, and this is why he was introduced. That worked really well. Uh, and now he is going to, to and look, you kind of knew he was, he would be, uh, you know, the one to uh, tame the dragon. Even knowing that, it still played out really well. And look, this show is. Uh, this this property is not against subverting your expectations where it you know um leads up or makes you think that the payoff is going to be him getting the dragon then have him die just flat there uh and have someone else and in actual fact they could have done it because there is a girl there who has very bright blonde hair as well so you know um uh, of targaryen line that he ends up protecting ducking behind a rock and at that point, I was thinking, okay, they could do an old bait and switch here and uh, have him die and have her, the one who was protecting, be the um, the one the dragon chose. And then you can still justify the fact that it was introduced and everything to set up, that the fact that he saved her life and enabled her to be the dragon and then she would remember him fondly and all that stuff. So it could have gone that way, but it didn't. Uh, but they do use her presence in a really cool way and uh, we'll get there when we get there. But I like that that... Um, that he, uh, uh, yeah, ends up being uh, of Targaryen descent, and they all go to Dragonstone. Kind of like, how covert is it? There's a big group of them on the seashore. Someone wouldn't someone see that and notice it and report it back? No, no one notices. It. It's like works out really well that they all just uh, end up going on a boat covertly to Dragonstone. Rhaenyra meets them, and uh, the um, uh, dragon keepers basically just rebel. They're not onto. They feel that the dragons are sacred and only dragon lords deserve it. But Rhaenyra's like. I need to do it anyway, so it takes him down herself. And uh, it is interesting how <laughs> she, she does. She's like, all right, someone come first and then let you guys handle, do, do your thing. Uh, the dragon's going to pick. It's up to the dragon. Now I can't do anything else. She leaves. And I thought they would have been taking him out one at a time. Uh, but she just like throws them all into the lion's den and let the dragon handle it. And first guy that steps up gets fried. The dragon then, uh, and so this is Vermithor, second biggest to uh, um, uh, Vagar, and he just starts eating and it goes into kind of this kind of horror scene where they're trying to run away, it's getting killed, several get knocked off the platform into the deeper depths of the um, of Dragonstone, where, all, where the dragons nest, basically. The, um, the guy who looked like he was pretending to be of um, Targaryen descent, you know, the, the joking kind of friendly guy from the bar, he gets knocked off as well. And also the blacksmith guy gets knocked off. And a lot of them are getting killed. 
And then it's like, they're just running for safety. And the blacksmith guy ducks behind a rock and the girl is there. And he basically gets her to be quiet, kind of saves her life. And then they both run out to try and get to safety. But they get knocked down by something, or Vermithor gets in the way, he falls down, and then it looks like the dragon is about to tromp her. And this is where he does something awesome. I, lo I love this moment, right? And I really like this character for it. He sees that the girl is about to get barbecued, and he just yells out, um, uh, here, uh, here I am, come after me. And he saves her life, willing to, like, like what a, what a boss chad also masculine move where it's basically he doesn't think that he is going to survive and in that moment he chooses to give his life for someone he barely he doesn't even know this is the first person but it's a woman that needs protecting it's the masculine role to do that he, you protect women and so he does it and he steps up and this is this is the interesting thing about you know game of thrones that they like for the large majority most people are dog crap jerks yet not everyone. There are moments of genuine heroism and nobility in fewer characters. But I, but the world is structured in such a way that because it's fewer people do it, when those uh, few people who are genuinely good and noble step up, it kind of stands out more. And Viserys stood out as just what a legend, you know, for everything he tried to do. And he was such a good moral guy. And so George clearly, the author, or the creator of all this world, right, isn't against noble no, nobility and heroism and uh, it was one of my favorite one of the re this is what the reason one of my favorite stories is is uh uh the hedge knight duncan egg um uh, which i always have floating around because uh, got the graphic novels hedge knight right and dunk is one of those few people who is genuinely genuinely noble and uh, good-hearted right um edard stark was one of those characters. It looks like this guy is one of them as well, right? Because uh, what he did here was genuinely, genuinely heroic. Um, Self-sacrificing. And then the dragons basically turned its attention on him and he just he yells, uh, uh, come on, just get it over with. And it's that kind of bravery that wins over Vermithor and he becomes the right. Well, like that was done beautifully. I, I, I love it because it wasn't just this, oh, he approaches the dragon and he doesn't really need to be challenged and the dragon just picks him because, you know, you got the right blood. He, he, has, he does something truly self-sacrificing and heroic, which, like, if I was to say, that's the thing that wins over Vermithor and says, you are worthy to be my rider. You are showing true strength and bravery here. Uh, and that was brilliantly done. Loved that moment. Me ah, and so... That might be my favorite moment in season two so far. Loved it. Um, heaps of other people died in the process. It wasn't his fault, but I was thinking, gee, that's one way to get rid of a lot of the bastards, illegitimate, you know, um, people that might have certain claims to, you know, uh, thrones and whatnot. Uh, not wasn't her intent, but uh, yeah, a lot of those illegitimate li <laughs> uh, children get, get taken out in that thing. And so the Oaf guy, I forget his name, but, um, you know, the joking, friendly guy, he just runs off because he's packing his dax, and he runs into the other dragon that needs a rider. And uh, this one felt like just, like, unlike the previous one where he kind of had to earn it, this feels like the dragon just, yeah, you're, you, you have the right blood, I'll pick you. Same with... It's a, it's a little bit the same, a little bit different with Sea Smoke picking his rider because he just kind of hunted him out. But this one is just, like, he kind of bumbles into it, and then the dragon says, yeah, yeah, oh, you'll do. You're, you're my rider now. So I, I, it, it can work both. I guess sometimes you need to earn it. Sometimes the dragon just picks you because reasons, right? And so this character is interesting because I'm yet to be won over by him. I'm not, he doesn't strike me as anyone particularly interesting. And, and not like heroic without that'll strike me there because you don't need there doesn't need to be a heroic character for me to be really interested and like the way the character's written because they're dynamic like Damon. So far with this guy, not enough there to make me say either way. Maybe we'll get more of him in the future episodes. But uh, the dragon picks him, and the next scene is him just kind of riding it over King's Landing. And a couple of questions that kind of get answered at the very end, which is, um, 
at first seems like, is he just out for a joyride over King's Landing? Because it's on King's Landing. The alert, see, uh, you know, gets raised. And Eamon races off to get uh, Vagar and deal with it because it's a threat. And Vagar's there to protect um, uh, King's Landing. Then the guy, like, you don't really get to see him react to, you know, Eamon getting on, on uh, his dragon. All you know is that it is a distance and Eamon is chasing him down. And so uh, he, Eamon chases him a good while. In fact, he chases him nearly all the way to Dragonstone. And I'd like to, like, how long does it take to get from one point to the other on Dragon back? Like 20 minutes? Is it that? Is it five minutes? I don't know. Because I was surprised at how far Eamon was willing to fly away from uh, King's Landing when he is the main deterrent and protecting force for King's Landing. And if it's that easy to draw him out, and if they had more dragons, they'd just draw him out and then attack King's Landing when he's away. Um, turns out they, it seems like they were trying to draw him out, but not to uh, take King's Landing in his absence. It seems like it was a trap to kill Aemon. But Aemon's kind of senses a threat soon, and he just tells um, his dragon to turn around. Vagar we're going back. And after he flies away, you see Rhaenyra kind of walk out of behind a hillside or whatever with the dragon there. And then you see Vermithor there and another dragon. And so it seems like they, this was actually a trap that they sent. Uh, I think it's Silverwing, this dragon is, uh, to draw out Vagar, And they were going to ambush him. He sends a threat, and go, but that seems to be what were they were intending because they're there waiting, right? And then that's when the episode ends, and the big kind of um, setup for the next episode is now Renera has a, more dragons and a big one. Vermithor's on their side, and uh, that's going to make. And so it's funny, like her reasoning when she was trying to convince the people to join her side is that this could end the conflict without bloodshed. And I was like, no, it's not. This is going to escalate things massively. It's just bringing more, you know, weapons of mass destruction to the table that will be used. And so just the result is going to be more mass destruction. Look, these are common, simple folk. Maybe they, uh, you could say that it's more reasonable. They wouldn't really um, perceive that reality that they would just take out the word. Yeah, you know, more, if we have more weapons to bear, they'll just surrender, right? It's like, no, no, no. This is going to cause uh, a lot of more destruction with more dragons on the field of battle, right? Uh, and that's what's very uh, uh, much getting set up at the end of this episode. So we have one episode left, The House of the Dragon Season 2, and uh, I'm I'm keen. Like, I'm expecting a bigger battle, a bigger conflict. Uh, don't know yet. I'll be annoying if they blue ball us, right? As, a, as the saying goes, where it leads up to this big battle and then they cut and they're on a cliffhanger for the first episode of season three. That would be annoying. If it's something, hoping for something, because it's really well set up now. And the pieces are in, in position for a big fallout battle or something. And I'm excited for it. I'm looking forward to it. Episode eight, the final episode. But overall, episode seven, this one, loved it. I thought it was great. There's some question marks here and there, uh, but there was some really great moments, and I think one of I think my favourite moment in the season so far. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, stay on watch.